the speeds are getting scarier and scarier. This is what I wonder with all the aero stuff. It's like, is the racing just so much safer if no one has the aero stuff? 98% of the way there, just doing the simple things. You've got 170 guys all trying to be in the same place at the same time. And that's when it, it gets super hard, so I think... You're literally a decade older than Tadej Pogacar, who's won the tour twice. Like, grow up. How did yeah. you silence those critics? How did you silence that voice and still maintain the lifestyle that it takes to produce the numbers to get to the world tour? It's this sort of all-encompassing lifestyle where it's about traveling, it's about people, it's about you know, different cultures, it's about performing in foreign environments, it's about the sort of whole package. And that's something I always enjoy about the race. Michael, welcome to the Roadman Cycling Podcast. Yeah, thanks, nice to be here. I've heard, heard many great things, so it's nice to find you on the show. Michael. I'm imagining somebody that spends their whole road cycling career trying to turn professional. They have this dream of going to the world tour. They're working part-time jobs. They're hustling. They're self-coaching, scraping cash together. You hit your thirties. All your mates and your family are kind of gone. Pack it in, buddy. You're a dreamer. The hopes are dashed. Then out of nowhere, you get a call from UAE offering you a contract. What the hell happened? Uh, it's, it's a good question, to be honest, and it's something I'm still sort of asking myself now. I mean, I was at that stage when it when it did sort of kick off that I hadn't given up over riding the world tour, but it had become more of a case of just enjoying riding my bike, enjoying the lifestyle, rather than this relentless pursuit of being professional. Um, I think that was probably a bit of a downfall in my early years, uh, trying to go pro was just almost trying too hard, you know, like so, sometimes you just have to relax and let things slide, let things go and the right things happened. And and essentially, I think that's really the way it happened with uh, my whoosh in, in gaining this this world to a contract. I all of a sudden wasn't obsessing over the small things as much and, and was just letting my legs do the talking, um, whatever I was doing. And I think that was a big part of, of, of me getting to where I am now. Because anyone that's been around cycling for long enough, you'll have seen these characters and people are going to be nodding in agreement to this, that they had a dream of going pro when they started out their cycling career. And yeah. it's like the, the heavyweight boxer that takes a fight too many and everyone's saying like, oh, come on, pack it up. They hold on to this dream into their late 20s and into their early 30s. And you're kind of looking at them and you're like, come on, Peter Pan, it's time to grow up. Like you can't live in your mom's basement riding your bike 25 hours a week, telling people you're going to turn pro. You're literally a decade older than Tadej Pogacar, who's won the tour twice. Like, grow up. How did yeah. you, you know, silence those critics? How did you silence that voice and still maintain the lifestyle that it takes to produce the numbers to get to the world tour? Well, I think that that's the big thing. It's, it's the lifestyle thing. I think lots of people misunderstand what being a pro actually is. They think it's just about producing numbers and being able to ride up, ride up a climb and have me watch per kilo and doing this. But it's this sort of all-encompassing lifestyle where it's about the traveling, it's about the people, it's about, you know, different cultures, it's about performing in foreign environments, it's about sort of the whole package. And that's something I always enjoyed about the racing or the, the riding, not just the actual physical riding itself. And I think that's what carried me so long into my career and, and still sort of racing to a high level when I was 30, it was, for me, it was always about the whole package, not just the riding. And I think if you keep doing what, what comes naturally and what you enjoy um, and keep following that path, then eventually um, the right things will happen. And I think that was that was the case for me. It was that it was really just a case of not trying too hard, I think, in the end, which is, which is funny because lots of guys obsess over the small details for their whole career. It just sort of eats them up, you know, and, and, and that – that quest for that pro contract almost becomes harder. The journey almost yeah, but, becomes harder than getting the actual contract itself, you know? But come on, you're being a bit too modest here. It's not just don't try too hard. There's plenty of our listeners now who are doing like one watt per kilogram and they're going, I'm not trying too hard. No one's offering me a world tour contract. You know, to go yeah. north to six watts per kilogram, you're doing more than having this laissez-faire, hands-off attitude of not trying hard. There's a lifestyle of sleep, diet, nutrition supplements you engineered you know I'm, I'm not sure how knowingly i'm sure quite deliberately you engineered the infrastructure that world tour riders have on a shoestring budget it's like the classic silicon valley bootstrapping where you mm -hmm. know some kid in a basement with a laptop builds this amazing social network that you know the best funded companies in the world can't do 
you're that kid in cycling terms in the Silicon Valley garage. Yeah, I mean, you have to have the raw talent. There's, there's no doubt about that. Um, and I think that's always been there. Um, I think, you know, of the how many guys in the world tour there are, I think there are a lot more guys that could potentially be in that pool. Uh, sometimes it's just a case of the right place, right time, and, and getting the small things right, even the sort of the off-bike things, the lifestyle, the living, um, just the, the general sort of sort of welfare um, is often that, that last 5 or 10% that you need to, to make that step up. So um, I think it's definitely getting a lot better these days. It's a lot more global sport. It's easier for riders from small countries like New Zealand to come over to Europe and to, to have that support and actually get a, a proper go at it. Um, I think, yeah, my generation was was the one that was sort of the last of the ones that I think really did it tough over in Europe. When I first went to Europe 10 years ago, there was not many Kiwis, not many foreigners uh, over here. And um, it was definitely, I think, a lot a lot harder than it is now. You know, like you had to, if you wanted to call home, you had to top up your Skype account, you know, with a few dollars. And there was no Facebook Messenger and WhatsApp and all that sort of stuff. So it was, it was a different world back then. But I think now it's becoming, I think, a lot easier. Um, and hopefully more guys get the chance. Yeah, I had I had no Wi-Fi when I was in France living there racing and yeah. you know, it's like France, it's like a 90 minute flight or two hour flight from Dublin. Yeah. But it, it may as well have been a 20 hour flight. You felt so isolated because you didn't know what was going on with your friends back home. It's like, I don't know, this is horrible. I'm homesick like and I'm only gone a day. Exactly. It's a funny story actually. I was um the first year I went to France, it must have been 2009 or something. I was staying with the B Box Blue Telecom team which is one of the big telecommunications uh, teams in France um, at their main service course. And it was probably the worst internet I've ever had in my, in my life. So literally in the home base of this team that was sponsored by the National Telecommunications Company, still <laughs> couldn't get in touch with back home. So it kind of goes to show how sort of cut off or isolated it was back then, um, which I think a lot, of, a lot of people struggled with. A lot of guys sort of fell by the wayside and, um, and gave it up too early. But I think if you can battle through those times, I think it creates some some pretty tough bike riders. So I think the new generations definitely are, I don't want to say no, soft, no, but um, they've got it a lot easier. And they certainly don't have the struggles that, that we had that sort of made, made us as resilient as we are now, the guys from my generation anyway. How important was Jay Vine getting the contract to through Swift? Because I know I had Jay on the podcast and we done this kind of year in the life of a Neo Pro where he came back on three or four times inside i'd say it was three or four times inside his first year with Alpes and fenix i haven't chatted to him about six months now since he's billy big time on uae so yeah, i must yeah. get him back on soon but how important was that to have someone like jay to make it real and say okay here's a kid from my part of the world who hasn't come through the traditional structure the traditional pathway of going to a belgian team signing for a french team into continental climbing the ranks and, and then into the world tour pass that he actually came through another online platform. Yeah, I think, it, it's, yeah, I think it's, Jay, Jay and I's story is, is a bit different in that I think Jay came, came purely from a, a virtual racing sort of background, whereas I'm a guy that came from a traditional background, then did the virtual racing, that then ended up in the world tour. But I think Jay's story is is great because it's show world to a team that guys that can ride on the home trainer can't just ride on the home trainer. You know, if you can do those numbers in the home trainer, you can do those numbers up the mountain in the world of Spania. And I think that sort of opened a few teams' eyes. It's like, okay, we actually need to start taking this seriously because we might miss out on the next Jay Ryan. Can you give us your numbers that you rode? Was there, like, the my whoosh, was it a, they looked at your overall data and they said, based on all this data, this dude's worth a contract? Or was there, like, an elimination series that you actually won out on? No, no, so it was a case of um, just me basically doing the racing with them over a, a number of months and then sort of taking notes and thinking, oh, this guy maybe has something. And then I got a phone call from them saying, can we do further testing? And then from there, I... um got in touch with a local sports scientist. They sent the testing protocol through that they, they used with the, the World Tour team. I did the test and obviously impressed them and yeah, the rest is history. Can you give us the numbers? It was like a like a rank test type thing and it was a lot to do with lactate as well. So there's a few different parameters in there. It's not just a case of this many watts per kilo for this amount of minutes. Um, they're, they're definitely very big on the, on the lactate stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, I think, um, <laughs> yeah, it, it's hard because I think lots of people sort of blow the, the watts per kilo thing out of the water a wee bit like you know, there's some guys in this team that are absolutely amazing up over a 10, 20 minute effort when they're fresh, you know, the best guys on the team, but then put them in a race after four hours and they're not the guys we would ride for. So it's not just about doing those numbers, it's about doing them 
fatigue. So, and that's also the biggest thing with, with the home trainer guys is you have to really build that fatigue resistance, which has sort of been the basis of what we've been doing with me the last few months. It's been very little actual sort of full gas efforts, um, sort of one, one-off max type things. It's been about doing the Ks and doing the efforts at the end of the training sessions. And is the final part to that, maybe something you're not going to struggle with as much as Jay, but it's the, you know, you could put out seven and a half watts per kilogram, but if you're starting to climb like in last wheel, you know, the splits have already <laughs> happened and, you know, there's no amount of watts per kilogram is going to put you at the front of that bike race. It's positioning. Yeah. And that's, I think, becoming more and more apparent because now the racing is is so stressful. Everyone is so close together. The the differences between the best guys and the worst guys is a lot smaller than it used to be. Um, everyone's fighting for the for the same positions. And now we have the the, the, the race radios with so much information from the directors. Anytime there's a small cobble section or a small narrowing of the road or a roundabout, everyone's directors on on the radio saying, "Oh, we need to be at the front here. There's a dangerous roundabout." And you've got 170 guys all trying to be in the same place at the same time. Um, so and that's when it, it gets super hard. So I think it's definitely became, I think, more of a thing, the positioning. And like I said, with the fact that there is less of a difference between the best guys and the worst guys, um, that's certainly where you look to, to, to take those small wins where, where you can. So I also think, yeah, like I said, that's why we're seeing more crashes and, and more issues like that in the racing these days. Yeah, because as you flag, there's such a small gap between the best guys and the worst guys. I, I remember when I was kind of 2014, 2015, when I would have had an eye on, oh, can I make a step up? Can I not? Six watts per kilo was super impressive. Somebody was doing six watts per kilo. They were stand out and people were talking about them stepping up to the next level. Mm. Nearly everyone's doing six watts per kilo these days. It's like, how did that happen? How do we get from here to there so fast? I think a lot of that comes from much better talent scouting. Um, so lots of World Tour teams have development teams now. There's just a larger pool of riders to, to choose from. Um, and also, I think with the, the nutrition, the equipment, everyone's doing that small things right now. Everyone's got the aero stuff. Everyone's got the chefs. Everyone's following the right diet plans. Everyone's kind of doing a similar type thing, you know. So I think that's, that's largely why. The speeds are getting scarier and scarier. This is what I wonder with all the aero stuff. It's like, is the racing just so much safer if no one has the aero? stuff rather than everyone having the aero stuff and it knocks 4k an hour off the average speeds yeah it's it's hard to know what's contributed mostly to the speed i think the aero stuff the positioning definitely the tires is a big thing the way we train i think has a part to play probably not as big as people think i'm a big believer that the basis of you know becoming strong is just doing the, the basic stuff right there's lots of guys that have gone about doing special intervals and you have to do this many minutes of this and do a lactate and blah 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 but i think you'll get 98 percent of the way there just doing the simple things. So I think it is largely the equipment. Um, but yeah, the bikes we have now, particularly with the tyres and aerodynamics and the clothing is a big one, the helmets, it all certainly adds up. Um, but yeah, as far as sort of numbers go and comparing numbers is what we do now to, to sort of 10, 20 years ago. It's I, I'm of the camp that you can't really compare the sport now to, to what it was. You know, you see, you see guys on Twitter and things saying, oh, you know, Tade or something did this climb so much faster than Lance or whatever. But I think it's just, it's apples and oranges, I think, these days. Yeah, yeah, it's totally different. Chatting to some of the, the guys that are racing World Tour at the moment, the directors and stuff. It seems like this ability to be robust is so, so important now because you're saying like you can train at 97% rather than trying to push to the last 100%. Well, if the dude who's doing 100% of everything, if he's missing two weeks every season because he's catching a chest infection, he's missing another week because he's catching an IT band issue that's putting them out of a week long race. That's actually much more important when you zoom out and look at the long-term data in terms of conditioning. Mm -hmm. Can you get to the start line is nearly as important as can you get to the finish line. Yeah, I, th I think the big thing that most people underestimate with World Tour racing is just the sort of relentless nature of it. So it's pretty rare, unless you're a you know a superstar in the sport, to actually turn up the races 100%. You know, you're always in a situation where you've raced a week ago, or you've had just a small illness, or you've got different goals in the season. So you're often turning up the races, and more often than not, at sort of 80 or 90%. But you still have a job to do. Um, anyone can say, you know, when, when they're on their best day, oh, I could have followed up that climber, I could have done those numbers. And it's like, yeah, but put half a season in the legs, you know, do a week long stage race, then have two days off, then go to a one day race and, and, and see how you go. It's completely different. So I think that's the biggest thing. And that's probably been the biggest, I guess, eye opener this season is really just being 
consistently good rather than trying to be intermittently perfect, I think is the key, particularly for someone in my role that's more of a domestic type guy. The words, there are the phrase that I had from a friend who was a, a director for a world tour team was, there's a word that comes before cycling, that's professional. Yeah. <laughs> Time and time again, what I do is cycle. What you do is professional cycling. That's turning up fatigued. That's racing with antibiotics. That's racing when you're injured. That's like yeah. racing, traveling that evening and racing again the next day. It's ridiculous. Exactly. exactly yeah. And I think that that's the big thing. But I, there's definitely, I think, yeah, certain things you learn with, you know, traveling and in, in, in different hotels and things that you can sort of mitigate a lot of those negative aspects of, of that part of it. So definitely everyone's got their own things to do whether it's they take their own food when they're traveling on you know planes and things or their own bedding or there's there's all that sort of stuff that it definitely adds up but everyone's got their, their small things and small week works that sort of help them get through well you guys still have it easy i read uh sean kelly's itinerary from back in the day <laughs> there we he, go he he raced tour of flanders he got a podium on the sunday he flew out sunday night started tour of basque country on monday won four of the six stages and the overall in Tour of Basque Country, which finished on the Saturday, flew back Saturday night and won Bay on the Sunday. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. But yeah, I think also sort of, I think another part of it is, is just how hard the races are these days. There's really don't no don't take away races. from Sean Kelly like no, that. Course, don't don't do not. that. Don't be that guy. <laughs> of course not, of course not. But no, you don't, you don't yep. have the sort of the old patrons of the bunch saying, oh, we're going to ride easy. The brakes gone. We're going to ride easy now. Well, today's not the day we attack. You know, the the guys like that that would sort of go to the front and say, hey, this is how it's going to be today. You know, it's literally almost every man for himself. Every race was full gas. Every race was hard. And yeah, everyone finishes completely spent. So I think the, obviously I wasn't around back then, but I think the mentality of the racing and the style of racing has also changed a lot. Do you think there's, you know, your teammates, and I'm not sure if you're friends with Tadej Pogaccia, but do you think there's uh, onus on the big superstars like, you know, Tade, Wout, MVP, Jonas, should they be stepping up more as a role of Patreon of the Peloton, or is that just gone now? Uh, I think it's just gone, to be honest. Um, and I think it's because of the, the sort of more commercial sort of, direction that cycling is going now there's a lot more money involved it's much more of a job now everyone just you know need, wants to get their job done sort of get paid and then move on to the next one you know it's there's not many people that are doing it purely for the passion i think now um there's a different i mean of course every you know these guys that love the sport um and i think most you almost have to, to to be able to do it but i think the mentality again is different you know there's some some big money involved now there's some some big pressure everyone's got jobs to, everyone's got a boss to answer to and everyone's just, I think, 100% focused on doing that job, no matter what a guy like Tato or Watt says, everyone answers to their director and their director only. But this is probably what's contributing, like, this is just me speculating from conversations I've had on the podcast. This is probably what's contributing to the very dangerous nature of the bunch at the moment. Like, I was chatting yeah. with Daryl Impey a couple of months ago, and we were talking about that crash in Flanders where the kid from Lotto caught his yeah. wheel in the grass and took out half the bunch. And he said he's talked to Neo pros. He's seen them doing some dumb shit. And he's yeah. like tapped them on the hip in a non confrontational, aggressive way. Like just later on in the race, he'd be like, hey, like that thing you done earlier on, like it, it went okay, but that could have went bad. And if it went bad, you were going to hurt a lot of people. And he yeah. said he was just, you know, just saying it to be friendly. As someone who's wore the yellow jersey, who's respected in the peloton, just to be a little bit friendly and to watch out for the kid. And he yeah. said he's just, the answer he gets every time is fuck off. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think the UCI needs to step up there and, and do some sort of red card system because I'm sure in previous years in Tour of Flanders someone's moved up on that, that bit of cobble or that, that footpath, you know, every year, you know, for yeah. however many years and nothing's happened, you know. It's but now yeah. something bad happens, they say, Oh, now we have to act on it. But they need to actually have something the same with sprints, you know, if you're boxed in and you know you're not going to get anywhere, you maybe you give someone an elbow because unless you have a chance of winning, okay, you may be relegated, but you weren't going to win anyway. And there's no yeah. one done. You know, you, yeah. to get fifth or get relegated to the back of the bunch is the same thing. But I think there needs to be a system where you shark and say, that was dangerous. You've got, you know, one yellow card or whatever, and you get two or three of those in a certain period, and you have to sit out two months of racing or something. Yeah, it's it's like the the idea of coming back on with uh, like if you're dropped and coming back on on the bumper of a team car it's mm. like if you if you get back on you're in the race and you get to contest the finish 
if you get caught, you're thrown out of the race. But who cares exactly. if you're thrown out of the race? Because if you didn't get back on, you were not back in the race anyway. It's such That's a bizarre exactly penalty. That. Exactly. So it just it just makes no sense, uh, sort of how they do it. And like we were saying earlier, with the speeds these days and 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 all the gear we've got, it's the equipment. It's if you do crash now in the sprint, often you're doing 70 k's an hour. You know, and it's quite different doing that sort of speed. You look at, you know, what happened with Fabio Jakobsen to Tour of you know. Um, but the, the thing with that is, like, you need to punish the consequences, like you were saying. You need to punish when Sagan leans into somebody for, you know, their sprint of a seventh and he leans into somebody. He needs to get that red card and that ban system. You can't just punish the consequences just because that went bad, bad that day for a variety of reasons. Downhill sprints, poor barriers. But it's the conduct that needs to be punished. Exactly. Otherwise, it's sort of, yeah, like you say, sort of punishing the action, not the consequence. So we don't want things to go bad before change is made, you know. So what the answer to that is, I think, is yeah, something we need to work out. I think it's something that the Riders' Union is going to have to sort of focus on over the next few years. But I think, yeah, something definitely has to change because the rate of crashes now, I mean, I think there was one point in the season that we had, I think, seven guys out with crashes and injuries and, and illness and whatnot. So there's just far too many guys that are that are going down. Um, and they're out for a long time now as well. Like, when you're that lean and that fit, you, you can hurt yourself really easily and you don't have that same recovery. There's but it's also like, I, I think it's such a traditional sport and they're fighting in ways to hold on to this tradition. Like we could definitely use big data and analyze the last 10 years of every race and see which races are the most dangerous and then put it back to the organizers and say, hey, like you're 50 percent, there's 50, you're 50 percent more likely to have a bad accident in your race than the the standard race. We need to address this or you don't get the race next year. Yeah, the problem with that is that if we did that, we'd never have another race in Belgium again because that's <laughs> That's just the part of the way it is, you know, and there's got to be a fine line because you can't make it so difficult for organisers that we can't have races because then everyone loses. So it's a case of finding a happy medium where the right measures are taken that are sort of reasonable, that they're actually achievable by the organisers, while also understanding that we're never, ever going to have 100% safe sport. And there's always, unfortunately, going to be crashes and things, but it's a case of sort of picking those, that sort of low-hanging fruit. And saying, okay, this is this is ridiculous. We have to stand up and, and do something about this. How was the the mood in the bunch post uh, the tragic death of Gino? Because that's the first one I can remember since probably Walter Whalen. So I'm, I'm sure there was some at lower levels, but at the top level of the sport. Yeah, I mean, I think Walter, Walter was the last one. I think died of a crash. I know the the young kids from Lotto. I can't remember his name now. Um, Bjorg Lambrecht, I think his name was. Yes, I remember that as well, yeah. He was the other one. But yeah, Walter Whalen was probably the last one, I think, in the Giro um, like that. But um, I actually haven't raced since then. I was actually racing with him in uh, Giffing, in the, 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 which was the one-day race before Swiss, that was sort of the lead-up to the Tour of Swiss. And to sort of be racing with a guy one day to then a week later, sort of hearing that news, it's, it's, it's pretty tragic, and I think... Also, the hardest thing for us riders is I think deep down everyone knows that there is no solution to that. It's just one of those things that if yeah, you can't, yeah, it's, it's just the way of the sport. Everyone, when we, we clip in every day, we, we have those risks. You know, if you're going downhill, it's, you know, even 70, 80 k's an hour on the road bike, you're in front of a blowout around a corner, you're always going to be in trouble. And it just takes sort of the wrong landing or the wrong direction that you fall for something like that to happen. So, I think that's definitely a bit of a, an opener, a bit of a wake up for everyone that, you know, we are vulnerable. And even if the road seems safe or the sport seems safe, we're always taking risks. And it's just about being sensible and mitigating those risks. But also, I'm saying that I don't know the specific details around the crash and what happened. Um, but from what I know, the road wasn't particularly dangerous. Yeah, I think that was a like a stark eye opener for not just pro cyclists, for cyclists of any level because like you're saying we've all been out like i was out this morning rail in the sense on the way down like just listening to music kind of losing myself 70 80k an hour on the sense and yeah we, we can normalize what's a very very dangerous activity and it's just when you chat to someone who's not in our bubble occasionally and they're like you do what speed on exactly, what with yeah. tires on exactly, those roads yeah. 
And it's yeah. like, it just needs something small, you know, equipment failure of any kind, something on, you know, unforeseen on the road and it can go bad, bad, very fast. So we actually had another girl only a week before that, who was a prominent Irish racing cyclist. She was hit with a car out trained and killed as well. So it was like that double header. It's really left me kind of questioning the risk to reward ratio of riding on the roads because you know i love riding on the roads and cycling you know it's my full-time job now talking about this and it's given me so much i've made amazing friends travel the world have the podcast amazing experiences but i have a young nephew now and he's only six months old and i'm just like what i recommend the sport to him it's just i don't know like maybe it's just the the proximity to those two tragedies that's clouding my judgment on it now and in six years time when he's of age i'll be you know getting them little miniature factor bi- carbon bikes but i don't know yeah 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 I'm, I'm sort of the same because sort of in recent years my um a couple of my sisters and uh, my sisters and my my dad have recently sort of started sort of riding pretty seriously now back home and every time you're out and you know you're there as well and you hear a siren or something you sort of get that sinking feeling um because particularly as a professional you know you, you feel like you should be the, the person that knows better or the, the person with that that voice of reason you know um but yeah, yeah, it's it's one of those things, you know. Life, anything you do in life can be dangerous. Um, but it's again the case of mitigating those those risks and not doing anything that's unnecessarily dangerous. We're kind of rolling into the second half of the season now. Uh, do you have? I'm assuming you signed a one-year deal with UAE. Is there performance metrics that have been discussed that will get you an extension to that contract, or where are you sitting at the moment with that? Um, that's a good question. So um, now is sort of the time that we discuss those things. Um, I haven't signed anything yet, but the reports seem to be positive. So fingers crossed that I can continue on. Um, ideally, I'd, I'd want to stay with this team. You know, this this team, UAE Emirates, has given them an opportunity, and I think the the role I have here is perfect. You know, with with the the big leaders and then guys like me to help. I think that's my natural sort of role as a domestic type guy, and to be with this team with always having someone that can win the race, always having a leader, a big star. It's really nice for me knowing I can do my job for someone that actually can win the race. You know, there's, there's nothing worse than trying to help someone that's, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, sort of in the back of your mind that's going to struggle to, to finish it off, you know. But in here, I just have full confidence in the leaders. And I think I've sort of slotted into my role really well. I think the, the team's seen that as well. Um, so hopefully sort of get something sorted in the next few weeks. Um, but yeah, there's also been, I think, a bit of a learning curve from the team side as well. It's the first time that I've sort of signed a guy purely, well, not purely, but largely from a, a home trainer, sort of a home trainer sort of sort of background. Um, so I think they're interested as much as anyone just to see sort of what I can do, how it progresses through the season, you know, particularly the later half of the season, the sort of resilience in the legs and um, and how that'll work. So, yeah, so looks good. And but it, it is quite and see. It, it is quite a unique way to come in as a domestic because you've come in like solely as a domestic where if, like I chatted to Michael Barry a couple of weeks ago who you know HTC Columbia T-Mobile yeah. and then Sky but if you trace Michael back pre-world tour pre-US postal days he's winning big big races and this the people we see as domestics you know you've seen Mitch Docker from out your part of the world settling as yeah. a domestic Sam Bewley settling in as a domestic I'm pulling some knowledge from your part of the world at the moment. I don't know where this is coming from. But like Buells was an animal on the track. Like these are superstars in their own right who then go to the world tour and, you know, settle into life as a domestique. They had aspirations to be team leaders and win Tour de France's. And then those aspirations were sort of dulled down. You've come into it really without any of those aspirations to win Tour de France. I'm sure in the back of your mind, you're still thinking it'd be nice but it, in reality you're there solely as a domestic yeah i don't know if it's just because i've sort of been around the sport for quite a while and i'm i'm sort of in touch with reality um <laughs> i just want to i'd rather be a guy that's a good domestic than an average leader you know like whatever i do i want to do my job well and, and have the respect of everyone in the bunch and i think domestics do get that um Oftentimes, the domestic, you're doing stuff that's not seen on TV. It's the small things that, you know, you're doing halfway through the bunch. You know, it's a bit of crosswind, just sort of sitting out of the gutter a bit to protect your leader or always asking for, for guys need bottles or advice or anything. It's it's all those small things that you do. 
that really makes her, I think, a, a really good a good domestic, which I think is becoming a bit of a lost art form with this sort of new push for teams wanting younger riders. Um, but I think now, particularly with guys that want World Tour contracts, I always talk to them and I say that if you want to get to the World Tour, you either need to be able to win or you need to be able to help someone win. Uh, Michael, it's been a blast. Best luck for the rest of the season and stay in touch. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks for your time. Good chatting.